glutamate is actually really the primary exciting neurochemical in the whole body. It stimulates the neurons of the brain excessively. And in the case of something like MSG, where it's highly refined and absorbed very instantly, it can even lead to cell death of brain cells. If you were talking about like the level of excitation or stimulation or activity of the whole body, what is that based on? The actual, the number one answer to that is glutamate above any adrenal chemicals or dopamine or anything else. Welcome to the Rejuvenate Podcast. I'm your host, Chrissy Hawks, and I'm here with my co-host, the creator and founder of Feel Younger and Genetic Insights, Elwin Robinson. And today we are discussing the insights we can get into our nutritional needs from our genetics. So tell me, Elwin, why did you want to discuss this topic today? Well, we've just done uh, the episodes, just released at the time of recording, the episodes on the, the Rejuvenate Blueprint. And the Rejuvenate Blueprint really is my Key to understanding really any health issue or achieving any health goal, the key is there's always, you know, one or usually several of the seven steps which are going to be the key to uh, resolving or achieving whatever you want. And so the first two steps, uh, spoiler alert if you haven't already seen that, are, you know, first of all, to understand your genetics, and then second of all, to uh, optimize your levels of the nutritional building blocks that we're all made out of, you know, and I include, you know, the big ones like water and uh, protein, stuff like that, but also the, the micronutrients, your vitamin K2, your magnesium, your whatever. These are all building blocks, meaning they're all the raw material, the matter that you and your body is built out of. And so they are the first two steps for a reason. Um, because often it's the easiest way to get a win with someone with minimal kind of difficulty, fairly minimal expense. Um, you know, it doesn't require a lot of discipline, willpower and all the rest of it. It's just about awareness and then, uh, you know, either having a food, a food change or a supplement change or both. And so, uh, in this episode, we're going to go through my genetic, uh, nutritional needs your genetic nutritional needs, Chrissy. Uh, we're going to compare and contrast a little bit, and we're going to talk about, oh, you know, given these genetic tendencies, what would we do about them? You know, sometimes um, they're actually fine. Like maybe you have a tendency for a low level or something, but that's not a problem. Sometimes it's something that you want to address. If so, how do you address it? Uh, what, you know, is a food a better option? Is a supplement a better option? If so, what type? How much? All of those kind of practical questions. And so I wanted to do an episode where it's uh, like a similar to what I would do in a consultation with someone if this is what they specifically want to focus on. Obviously, in a consultation, I wouldn't talk about me, but we'll do that. So we have another person. <laughs> who's it's nice to, to have that reference results. point. Yeah, yeah. We, can, we can compare. <laughs> if you have no intention of ever getting your genetics done for whatever reason, uh, that's totally fine. I respect that. I would say the episode, I will aim to make it still worth listening to because you'll still learn a lot about different nutrients, why you need them, what you would do about it if you need them, how to tell if you can need them, best ways to replenish them, all of that kind of stuff. So um, the vast majority of it will still be relevant to you, even if you don't intend to ever test your genetics. However, for those of you who are not, uh, who haven't made a final decision, who are a little bit open to learning about the possibilities, hopefully it will show you, oh, this is what is possible. And also some limitations, right? Obviously, using your genes, we can't tell you the level of nutrients that you need right now, because that's going to vary a lot. So the genetic information that we get are based on what are called SNPs. And SNPs are little single variations in your genetic code. And they stay the same um, throughout your lifetime. So epigenetics is kind of the way that those genes are read or expressed and based on your lifestyle, your diet, all that kind of, the environment, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so that is relevant as well. And so we're going to look at how do we actually navigate that. So if our report says that we need more, you know, whatever, calcium doesn't necessarily mean we need more calcium. Should you go and buy a calcium supplement or should you test for that? Like, how do you approach that situation? That's the kind of stuff where going to get into. We're going to get very practical. Beautiful. And I also love it too, because, you know, deciding to look into the genetics, especially on these nutrients, as nutrients is, you know, a step in the rejuvenation blueprint, and it's, you know, a good one of the beginning ones, it, it helps give you that launch pad already. And as well, like a lot of people, I think, you know, may not understand 
the absolute uh, importance of what a suboptimal level of one particular nutrient, the knock-on effect that could have in their health. Yes. And we'll talk about that a little bit, Um, certainly for the nutrients that we end up putting the magnifying glass to and focusing on. Uh, We've done a few episodes on that already. So if you're interested in that, definitely check that out. Um, we've done, um, yeah, uh, an episode that talks about it on a high level. And then we've done a bunch of episodes as well. where We go deep on specific nutrients, but so this will be a little bit less like a theory, like those episodes and a bit more like a consultation where we talk about the practicalities of, oh, okay, you've got these results. What do we do about it? But again, plenty of theory as well for those who just want to learn without ever <laughs> doing a genetic test. <laughs> Beautiful. So where do you want to start, Owen? Yeah, Chrissy. Well, so let's start with looking at your genetics, actually. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll probably talk about mine as a point of contrast between yours at various times. And then uh, once we've done that, if there are any left over that we haven't talked about yet for you, then we'll talk about them for me. So okay. we can give people more education about it. And so... Um, By the way, if you're watching, if you're listening to this audio only, I know we're getting a lot of people who are, uh, we started off with mainly YouTube viewers, but now we're getting a lot of people on Spotify and Apple Podcasts as well. Uh, I'm going to attempt to um, start uploading video versions of this on Spotify. So if you're on Spotify, then uh, look out for that. Uh, Otherwise, you know, they are always on YouTube. And we'll be referring to things on the screen, but I'll try not to do it too much. So if You know, I mean, honestly, I get it a lot of the time when I am uh, even watching podcasts, I'm often just kind of listening to it in the background. So, um, yeah, I'll try not to refer to what's on the screen too much, but we're going to do it a little bit to obviously explain what we're looking at here. So let's get straight into it. So uh, on this screen here, we've got um, the kind of inside your genetic insights portal by the way christy thank you very much for allowing us to look at this and sharing it with the world we take privacy you know extremely seriously in genetic insights we never share this information without the person's extremely explicit approval and uh you know that they're more than happy to do it so so we can see on your reports christy uh what probably strikes us straight away is number one on this list of uh risk is an increased need for iron so you have an increased need for iron anyway, as a woman of, um, what's the word, reproductive age, menstruating age. Um, But we can see that there is more to it than that. And, uh, you know, you've given me permission to talk about this. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, Yes, (laughs) you have permission. (laughs) That uh, when when you have done your test results, that it in fact has been... um, Low, correct? Yeah, for a very, very, very long time. And in fact, we discussed it because I used to give blood, you know, I'm you know, O negative, so I used to donate. And it was one of those things that like maybe hold off because iron levels are so low. Yes. And iron's one of those tricky ones. There are, you know, whole communities of people focused on helping people get more, but there are also whole communities of people focused on helping people have less, especially what they call unbound iron. Um Excess iron is, in a way, as bad as deficient iron. Uh, I say in a way because it's not as potentially life-threatening, but it's certainly not good either. It can Excess iron can quickly accelerate uh, a premature aging and even death, So, uh, but it's not as seriously immediately lethal as a deficiency of iron. So a deficiency of iron is you know, most, common, most commonly, of course, known that it can lead to uh, anemia, which is where your red blood cells are not able to transport enough oxygen uh, to the cells, which of course can be life-threatening. It means you can asphyxiate, you know, even if you're breathing just fine, if the red blood cells are not transporting the oxygen from the lungs to the cells, then you're going to have a serious problem. And so, uh, yeah, that's an important thing to know. And of course, it does explain a little bit, right, Chrissy? Even when you have followed all the kind of standard advice, at least, about increasing your iron levels, it has not been very successful. Correct. So if we see, I've actually opened up the report here, and I'll read it for people again, for those that are audio only, but uh, I'll read the relevant portions. But as it says here, it's an essential mineral. It helps make hemoglobin, which is that oxygen transport that I was just talking about. Supports the brain and immune system function. Um, most of the bo- iron in the body can be found in the red blood cells, and some is stored in the liver, muscles, and other parts of the body. And the best way to get enough iron is to eat iron-rich foods. And then it gives a list there. Uh, The list is uh, meat, seafood, legumes. I know some people would argue about that. I'll 
uh, dark leafy greens, ditto. I'll just stress that in a minute. Uh, dried fruit, uh, uh, fruit and fortified foods. And then it says adults should be getting 18 milligrams of iron per day. Now that is a um, composite that does vary significantly depending on if you're a man or a woman. Um, and so we can see here, if we look at the next page, Chrissy, what's that based on? So in some cases, some nutrients, the recommendations are based on just one genetic variant because it's significant. But you can see in this case, this is based on 446,739 genetic variants. So a lot of genetic variants have been evaluated in order to come to this conclusion that you have an increased need for iron. And sure enough, we can see here that, uh, so... The There's quite it, a lot <laughs> yeah. over there. Yeah. <laughs> so we, again, for audio listeners, you're seeing we have this column called genotype where it basically shows what variant you have. And green is like good, orange is neutral, and then red is uh, high risk. And Chrissy has mm, 80% high risk, something yeah. like that on this list, yeah. which is a very high percentage. And it um, would explain why this is at the top of her list for risk uh, factors. It's not really based on iron being more important than any other nutrient. It's just based on the fact that my risk is, level is so high. Yeah, the high risk level is uh, really high. So, and you know, it talks about some of the deficiency symptoms, uh, you know, related to anemia, weakness and fatigue, pale skin, shortness of breath, dizziness, cold hands or feet, brittle nails. Now, of course, all of those are symptoms of anemia, which could also be caused by B twelve. Could also be caused by but low B12 can be caused by low folate, can be caused by low copper, uh, could be caused by various other things, but those are the most common. And uh, it says the groups that are higher, more at risk are women, children, routine blood donors, which you just yeah. talked about, Chrissy, um, and vegetarians. I know that last one upsets some people. I remember I used to be upset by this. I remember working with someone, God, about 10 years ago, back when I was a strict vegan, and being very frustrated that uh, I just couldn't help them to up their level, their levels of iron without not even supplementation. Unfortunately, we'll talk about really? that for a second. Yeah, they had to uh, go back to eating meat in order to be able to. And uh, separate from my supervision, this you know much later, but they told me that they even ended up in hospital with serious anemia because they were so committed to their vegetarianism back then and. So by the time she found me, she was like, oh, you know, can you help me to raise it? And I was like, oh, I'll do my best. And I couldn't, unfortunately. Um, she had this, you know, I don't I don't know, but I'm guessing maybe one of these genetic variants that made it you know, specifically difficult for her. Then there's a big list of uh, all the issues that genetically high iron may cause. You can see it's a very big list. I won't read them all out because it's not really relevant to you, Chrissy. Um, so, yeah. What I wanted to do first of all is say what I would, what well, the advice that I would give for uh, iron, and then we'll also look through some of the recommendations in the report. So the recommendations in the report are uh, recommendations that are very specific to your DNA, which is awesome. The one thing about that is that often the most general recommendations might not be in there because um, we can only include something in this report if there has been. Uh, if there have been studies that prove that it help for, you know, a specific thing, your specific variants, exactly. If no one's actually bothered to do the research to see if a recommendation is relevant for your variant, then we can't include it in there. So iron, I would say, is in a way my least favorite nutrient to help people with. Um, for the reason I just said, it can be very controversial. Um I'm definitely not one of these purists that you see all the time that says, oh, it's much better to get it from food, don't get it from supplements, supplements are bad for you, all of this kind of stuff. However, I must say that iron is probably the nutrient that I think is the biggest exception to that, The supplementation of iron specifically uh, often is ineffective or not very effective. Why is that? Because... The type of iron that everyone can absorb better, and at least some people seem to only be able to absorb at a level that can sustain them, is heme iron, which is the iron that naturally exists within uh, animals, but not plants. And so a person who is committed to... Strict vegetarian, vegan lifestyle, yeah. they wouldn't want... Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, it can be a challenge. 
Now, when a person has a kind of variant like you do, Chrissy, it's possible that even, you know, just eating a bit of chicken here and a bit of fish there and that kind of thing, that also doesn't cover it. And that I think that was actually your experience, right? You're not a strict yeah. vegetarian or vegan. No, and, no, and it's no. And I've still- grown up, I've grown up in the Midwest, you know, red meat, things like that. So, and and it's been with me my whole life. Yes, and so that's you know not super common. It's you know vegetarians will point out that's not the norm, and that is true. But it is true for people who have this variant, or at least it you know very easily can be. And so then we want to be looking at, I would say, a couple of different factors. First of all. So first of all, I would test for iron. Let's start with the basics, as you have done, Chrissy. The reason being that too high iron is as bad as low iron. So as we go through, there'll be certain nutrients that it says that you or I need an increased need for. And with some of them, I'll say, you might as well just take it, right? You might as well just have the food or the supplement because there's really no huge risk with overdoing it. That's the case with some nutrients. With some nutrients, there is a risk for overdoing it. In fact, there is a a big list here in front of me of all the things that can potentially happen if you do have that opposite genetics that you do, Chrissy, and you have that tendency to hold onto iron and build up iron, and that's not good either, uh, potentially, in in some cases. So we want to test to be sure. The good news of that is that iron is the most commonly tested of all the nutrients by normal medical doctors. So you very likely can get it tested either for free if you're in a country where healthcare is free or taxpayer funded and you can almost always get it uh, tested by you know your insurer or whatever without having to pay any extra so um it's definitely worth testing it's easy to test if for whatever reason you don't want to go to a doctor or whatnot it's also very easy to self-test you can do it with a finger prick blood test it's usually among the cheapest of all tests and the thing that you really want to test more than actually iron, ironically, is uh, something called ferritin. And ferritin is your stores of iron. So it's like your reserves of iron. And your, fer- your ferritin, you want to have at a level that is not high and not low. Um, I would say for men, maybe something like 50 to 80 is optimal. And then for women, maybe like 60 to 100, something like that. Um, I say it the other way around of what it normally is because it's so easy for men to build up too much and it's so easy for women to to deplete theirs. I just want to speak to that point because, and again, it's, um, oh God, what do you call it? The um, Yeah, because I forgot my old blood test here, my ferritin level, and I'm talking NG slash ML. Like the last time I had my ferritin tested was in May 2022 and it was at 15. This is not great considering it should be the low end is 24 and the top end's 336. Um, my last iron, I'm sorry, because I just thought this one might be relevant. So my iron was, and I'm talking UG slash DL, was 66. And the base is the range is 65 to 176. So yeah. So your body is keeping yours at just about a threadbare level there in terms of actual iron in the blood because it has to. Um, you know, generally you don't see it much lower than that unless a person has some kind of bleeding condition, uh, like internal bleeding condition. It's pretty pretty unusual, although obviously it does happen, like the case that I just mentioned a few minutes ago. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that's that's pretty depleted. And that's before you and I started working together, I believe, Chrissy. Um, yeah. And it has not gone up to the level we'd like yet is last time I remember talking about this with you, but it had gone up considerably from that is also what I also remember. So recommendations. I would recommend, and I'm giving my recommendations first and then we'll see what the genetic ones were. So number one recommendation I would say is uh, red meat. It is higher in uh, that heme iron on a as regular basis as you can tolerate it for you know all kinds of reasons the cost the taste the price digestion the digestion (laughs) the whatever you know uh the moral the morality any anything um but yeah the red meat really is the highest um beyond that i would also in terms of food i recommended to you i believe um organs i would specifically recommend heart because it is higher in iron but it's still low in toxicity. The heart is more of a muscle than kind of an organ, even though it is an organ in many ways, um, including from a food preparation point of view, you can almost treat a uh, heart as if it were 
you know, any other piece of cut of meat in terms of preparation. It's quite tough, but you can stew it just like you would, you know, the chuck steak or whatever it might be, like the tougher pieces of steak. Whereas, you know, a, li a liver or kidney or whatever, you have to treat very differently, right? So you can kind of treat the heart the same as, uh, you know, a piece of steak. Um, so there's a benefit of that while being significantly higher in heme iron than, than most muscle meat. Uh, and the other recommendation I think I gave to you was spleen at the time. So the spleen of all the organs is the highest in iron, significantly higher than the liver as well. The benefit of the spleen over the liver is that the spleen um, has less of some of the minerals that could be toxic or some of the vitamins that could be toxic. So it's got less vitamin A, it's got less copper. It's also got less generally the heavy metals like uh, cadmium and and uh, mercury and lead and all of that kind of stuff. So overall, spleen is a pretty good choice. And that's something that you can get the freeze-dried capsules of if you know preparing spleen in your kitchen is not something <laughs> um, that you're yeah. willing to do. A couple of other recommendations. Um, vitamin, vitamin C and copper. I just talked about copper. A lot, most people have excessive levels of copper, but you do need in my uh, from my understanding although i know that that's contentious um so you do need a certain amount of copper though for the absorption of iron and so that can be something to try if you're on a super low copper diet to actually increase the copper and see if that helps with the absorption of iron another thing is vitamin c which you can either have again in a supplement or so that's you know adding lemon juice adding fruits adding you know uh good few vegetables as well especially like green vegetables to the meal that contains the iron so if you have your steak or your heart or whatever then having lemon juice with it having some kind of fruit with it you know your mango or whatever um mango also is quite high in iron which is probably why that's the first fruit that came to mind um and then also having um uh, you know green peppers and broccoli and all that kind of thing all of that also has uh, vitamin c people who uh, say the opposite, like they want to uh, take things that stop them absorbing iron because their iron is too high, they'll be told to avoid combining those two foods because it works so well. So that's another tip. But honestly, the best tip I have and the one that I found to be the most effective is something called lactoferrin. And so lactoferrin, the name sounds like ferritin, but it actually doesn't contain any iron. Lactoferrin is a part of colostrum. And colostrum is that milk the first milk that the mother produces and gives to the uh, the calf or the baby, depending on the animal, usually it comes from cows, that helps to boost their immune system. That's the simple way of putting it. And lactoferrin is a fantastic substance. I think we've talked about it before. If not, we'll talk we about have, it in different. Yeah, yeah one of the good. nutrient okay. episodes, I believe. Yeah. Okay, I don't know if we've done a deep dive, but I'm sure we will at some point because I'm a big fan. I still am. It's great for digestion, great for immunity, great for lots of things. But one of the ways that it works is it stops the iron from being consumed by any bacteria or other pathogenic organisms in the intestinal tract and helps to bind to it and transport it through the intestinal wall into where you want it to go. This is important because it turns out, first of all, it's the unbound iron, which is the most troublesome kind that some gurus have kind of pinpointed as the root cause of all disease. I don't know if they're right about that, but certainly it's an issue. Um, and then, you know, the last thing we want to be doing is feeding pathogenic organisms. You know, iron is food for pathogenic organisms. Um, copper is not. Copper is the opposite. Copper is very toxic to pathogenic organisms. Uh, but iron is food for them, even though they're quite similar. They're very different in that way. And so lactoferrin is fantastic, first of all, because it stops the bacteria eating them. So it stops you feeding um, dysbiosis and making it worse. And second of all, which is more why I use it in the past, but second of all, it helps you to absorb the iron. So bac bacteria don't eat it, you do eat it. <laughs> so it can actually get into your bloodstream, be utilized by your red blood cells and build up your ferritin levels. So that's actually my number one recommendation. And I've seen where people have tried like half a dozen different types of iron supplement, tried eating steak every day and all the rest of it, still not getting very far. Start taking, you know, 250 milligrams, 500 milligrams of a good quality lactoferrin, which is not cheap, I will be honest. It's certainly more expensive than iron supplements. I'll call out some brands. I like uh, the AOR one because it has the least fillers in. 
A O, sorry, A O R. A O R. Okay. There's also Life Extension, which the quality seems fine, but they just have more fillers in and Jaro, same thing, more fillers. Uh, so I prefer the AOR, even though it costs a little bit more. But I would say, yeah, I mean, it's not cheap, but I consider it to be, you know, essential supplement for people who want to support digestion or health or iron absorption. Those would be, you know, the big three. I mean, there's a bunch of other benefits, but those would be the specific cases where I would generally recommend it. And so, uh, yeah, I've seen cases, as I was saying, where nothing else worked and then the person kind of actually reduced... <laughs> Uh, their iron supplementation, especially because they were kind of annoyed that it didn't seem to be working and just had like to ferritin and then their iron, iron levels and their ferritin went up. So now in that case, and I, I want to say this because otherwise someone's going to say I should have said it, there is a dysbiosis si situation going on if that's what happens, right? Like that means that the problem was not just what you have, Chrissy, which is iron utilization, but there was also a problem in that case where uh, pathogenic organisms were eating the iron and not allowing enough to get through. But of course, that could be an issue for you as well, just because you have that genetic variant. So uh, if you haven't already, I would try that one uh, for that reason. Oh yeah, I remember the episode where we talked about it so fair, and it was when we were talking about cholestasis. So okay. that's the digestive part of it. That's it's very good for cholestasis as well, where, where the uh, bile is not flowing correctly. So those would be my top recommendations. Uh, let's see what the actual recommendations for you which are unique to your DNA are. So uh, interesting. First one is avoid tea after an iron-rich meal. So the reason for that is because the tea, I think the tannins in tea um, prevent the absorption of uh, the iron. So if you want to reduce your absorption of iron, tea and coffee is useful. If you want to uh, increase your absorption of iron, not having tea or coffee with your iron is very useful. And you can see it cites a study here with a 39% decrease in iron absorption um, with coffee and then a 64% reduction with tea. So tea especially, very strong impact on reducing iron absorption. So if you're going to have tea or coffee, it just means have it separate from your iron-rich meals. I'm going to go through these fairly quickly, otherwise it's going to take forever. Uh, recommendation number two, avoid uh, perchlorate. And so this is a chemical which interferes with the thyroid gland. That's the main reason why you would not want to have it. Um, but it can also, uh, perchlorate can also interfere with iron absorption. And so again, it's like a study here. If, um, again, yeah, because I want to go through so many nutrients today, I won't go into it more, but you can look up which things contain perchlorate and uh, how to avoid them. Alpha GPC choline. This is an interesting one as third place. Uh, this is obviously something I recommend. I think I have recommended it before. It's a type of choline which is uh, well utilized by the brain to turn into acetylcholine, the memory molecule. But it turns out that it's also effective at helping the absorption of um, uh, iron. In fact, in the study cited here, it seems to be comparably effective as vitamin C or as absorbic acid, uh, ascorbic acid. So um, alpha GPC is good anyway for memory, which I know is a thing you want to work yes. on, Chrissy. <laughs> so it's another good reason to uh, include alpha GPC. Do a couple more. Beef heart, we just talked about that already. Beef heart is full of iron. Avoiding coffee, we talked about that a minute ago. Spleen, oh, there you go. A lot of my recommendations are showing up here for you as well. Also, yeah, includes B12, it says, which uh, it can also help with that iron absorption if you need it. And then it starts recommending some food. So we've got guava here uh, as being high in iron, Chrissy, um, as well as ascorbic acid, so helping it be absorbed. Coconut, specifically, I think the coconut meat rather than the uh, oil, like a young coconut meat. Chard, oh yeah, I was going to address this. So the problem with legumes and uh, green vegetables as a source of iron is that they also contain anti-nutrients which reduce the absorption of those nutrients. <laughs> right. They contain some... Nutrients which help the absorption, like copper or uh, vitamin C. But so, you know, for some people, it's of limited effectiveness. Blackstrap molasses is like a, an old naturopathic kind of traditional way of reversing iron deficiency. Some people report a uh, great benefit from that. Liver, you know, we don't recommend on this channel uh, for reasons we've talked about previously. Uh, we talked about iron supplementation. Oh, lactoferrin, there we go. We've got it there at number 15. But strength is so far down, but, you know, for, but from having, you know, 
had you explained it the way you did, it, uh, yeah, definitely. You can be see up there. here the problem is a lack of evidence. So that's what I was saying mm, at the beginning right. of this, just that the studies haven't been done yet with your genetic variant. So we're listing it here because it is helpful. Um, but honestly, this list beyond a certain point, the order of it is a bit arbitrary because it's basically none of them have any evidence, if that makes sense. So the first few, we have the impact and evidence because there's the studies. So there just haven't been enough studies, unfortunately, of nutrition. It's not common that there are so few recommendations <laughs> right. that have uh, like a good impact and evidence score. But yeah, unfortunately, there's just not enough research on it. So I wouldn't put too much uh, weight on that. Of course, but it may not help you. You know, it's um, it would be one of my first recommendations, uh, but not necessarily for everyone. So that's iron. Um, and we spend quite a bit of time with that, but it is your number one issue and it is a real yeah. issue for you. And I know it is an issue for a lot of our listeners as well. So, you know, I was happy to zoom in on that one a little bit. I hope you're enjoying this episode. I just need to take a moment to quickly tell you about a way that you can support the podcast by getting high quality, affordable supplements that Elwin and I personally use, and that's Feel Younger. What I love about Feel Younger is they have great quality products with minimal fillers, but the prices are very affordable. You can call their customer support team 20 hours a day, seven days a week, and in my experience, they're really helpful and friendly. And what I love most of all is the amazing descriptions Elwin's written for each product category about that topic. There's so much information and education on it. I've actually learned more from reading their product descriptions than I have for most articles. So to support the podcast, please use Feel Younger for all your supplement needs. And to let them know we sent you, you can use promo code rejuvenate me for a 20% discount off your first order at feelyounger.net. That's 20% off your first order with promo code rejuvenate me at feelyounger.net. So the next category we've got here is more in the area of a macronutrient issue. And so this is actually not about needs, but I'll talk about it a little bit anyway. And so the three main sources of calories for people are uh, proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. And really, protein should be more of a source of amino acids as building blocks for the body, for you know every system in the body, peptides, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so really want our fuel to come from carbohydrate, fat, and probably a combination of the two. And yet not everyone does very well with all of those, right? Some people don't do well with fat, some people don't do well with protein, some people don't do, don't do well with carbohydrate or some kind of combination of those. And so for you, Chrissy, a couple of things are called out here for you. It's saying you don't have a great response to dietary fat in general, and then you don't have a great response also to saturated fat specifically. Now. In this channel, we're quite a fan of saturated fat and we recommend it often. But the truth is always, you know, it's not as simple as just this is good, this is bad. It always depends on the person and their genetics. And it also depends on the situation to some degree. And so what we're indicating here is that um, let's say if you tried a ketogenic diet that, you know, is mainly like butter um, and, you know, uh, lard and stuff like that and beef fat tallow you might not feel so great this is what this is indicating that makes a lot of sense and so yeah that's what i think is such a great you know tool to have in your kit of being able to look at your genetics potentially before you embark on something like that because i would think twice yes and now it's not to say um i think the mct oil i would call an exception to this so you could still have coconut oil i think you could definitely have like mct oil uh, because it's absorbed in a different way. So I wouldn't be as concerned about that, despite having this genetic reading. Uh, if we look at as well how you do with the other types of fat, because we actually have all the main types of fat here. Yeah, so according to this, you actually have a good response to unsaturated fat. And your body you know, is happy maintaining normal levels of oleic acid, which is the uh, omega-9, I believe. Or is it omega-7? I think it's omega-9. Um, monounsaturated anyway, fatty acids. So in this case, the kind of Mediterranean diet may well be better for you. So more, so not very high fat. Again, nothing wrong with having maybe even 30, 40% of calories from fat, but doing like a keto thing where it's 80% of calories from fat might well disagree with you, according to this. May not be true in your experience, but it's worth, let's put it this way. It's, there's more to life than only your genetics. This is true. But at least let's say if you were to try that kind of diet and you didn't feel good, 
don't assume you have to push through it. Right. right. It may right. just actually just not be good for you. And if you are, if you do want to push through it, then consider. Now we're not a big fan of unsaturated fat on this channel, like you know omega sixes specifically, but certainly some omega sevens, which is a form of unsaturated fat. It's just the monounsaturated fat. So, for instance, olive oil, um, avocado oil, they might be types that are more suited to you, if that makes sense. Definitely. And those are the type of oils I use too, <laughs> just there naturally anyway. So, <laughs> Awesome. So is that good then to have that validated that even though you hear people like me and all the rest talking about the benefits of saturated fat, that this is what works for you? Mm -hmm. Definitely. There you go. And then also, just while we're here, we can see you actually have a better response to dietary protein. And so that's not the case for everyone. You know, some people on a high protein diet, they really struggle. Not many, but some. As you can see, like there's a minority who does really well with dietary protein. There's a minority who does badly. And most people are kind of in between. But um, yeah, you do well with it. And is that your experience? Can you eat plenty of protein without it being an issue? Yeah. That's great. Awesome. And again, these... These are all these results are accurate for you so far, but they aren't always, you know, because there can be, you know, stuff going on for you at the moment, which means that things that should be good for you are not and stuff like that. But um, it's a sign that you are healthy, Chrissy, which I know that you basically are, that all of this, the more healthy you are, the more accurate your genetic right. results <laughs> tend to be when it comes to nutrients. The less, the more healthy you are, the less accurate they are in terms of health risks as people, you know, they don't have any problems and then they get told they have all these risks and they don't actually have the symptoms. Uh, which is good, but it makes it seem like the res reports are less accurate. I, I work with a lot of health gurus who put a massive amount of effort and time and money into health, and then I go through their reports and they're like, oh, I don't have that issue, I don't have that issue. <laughs> Whereas if I sp speak to a more, what I call, normal person like me, by the, t by, the time they're, by the time they're in their 40s, they tend to have developed a lot of their high-risk health issues, unfortunately, just like I do. And as well, like you've stated in the past, that your genetics, your, your DNA is not your destiny. And so, you know, that's also a big part of it as well. It's a great tool to have. And even better that if there was a potential risk and you don't have it, then you're doing something right. Absolutely. Yeah. And so let's, we just talked about protein. Let's move to amino acids. One of my favorite topics, uh, as you know. And so you actually have a few amino acids here that you have uh, either increased need for or lower levels. I kind of interpret those as roughly the same, um, but we'll talk about, there's a reason why, there's a reason why they're classified differently, which I'll, I'll talk about. So let's talk about the top one here, tyrosine. So this is third on Chrissy's list of most high risk or most increased need. And so that's tyrosine. Now this must be, you know, don't know if it's one of the least talked about amino acids, but it's certainly not talked about a lot, but it's the most talked about on this channel. <laughs> um, and that's because it's very, very important for a few different things. It's the building block for dopamine, which then becomes adrenaline and noradrenaline. So it's the building block for both your stress chemicals and also your uh, chemical of desire, chemical of uh, passion and enthusiasm, motivation, and also mental clarity. It's also the building block for thyroxine or T3 and T4, which are your thyroid hormones. In fact, T3 and T4, all T3 and T4 means is it's tyrosine-free iodine or tyrosine-4 iodine. So meaning it's one molecule of um, the amino acid tyrosine and then either three or four molecules of iodine. So that's, that's all it is. It's tyrosine plus iodine is what a thyroid hormone is. So tyrosine is really obviously crucial for that. And then tyrosine is also the building block for melanin, which is uh, your color pigment. But there's a lot more to melanin, which I promised I'd do an episode on that's still <laughs> coming at some point. But it's uh, kind of like another energy system throughout the body that is, uh, you know, like ATP in the sense of providing cellular energy, but in a very different way. And so the reason why I focus commonly on um, tyrosine is because whenever I see it, and I see it a lot, I immediately ask if I can see the person's thyroid results. Because again, like iron, it's commonly tested by doctors. So levels of TSH, T3, T4, maybe the thyroid antibodies. Um, and sure enough, a lot of the time when a person has an increased need for tyrosine, they have suboptimal levels of thyroid hormone. They have 
some degree of hypothyroid symptoms, maybe not the full full blown medical version, but the suboptimal, you may want to optimize level at the very least. And sometimes the full blown medical version, as in my case. And so if you Google it, like can tyrosine deficiency cause hypothyroidism? You they they say no. Like tyrosine deficiency is so uncommon and you know it's so easy to get from diet and all the rest of it. But this just hasn't been my experience clinically. This hasn't been my experience dealing with people. I see over and over and over again this correlation between an increased need for tyrosine, which I see a lot, maybe because I talk about thyroid a lot, so I attract those clients more, and a person actually needing uh, thyroid support. And so some people are happy to go on thyroid straight away if they can find a doctor who will give it to them because they want to feel better but some people resist that some people don't want to go and see a doctor some people don't want to take a, a hormone even if it's a bioidentical hormone because they they want to be purists or whatever all of that's fine and so in that case i often say to them start with just taking some tyrosine and see if you feel better and then you know take a decent dose and then test it again in a couple of months and see if your thyroid levels have improved Honestly, in my experience, usually the thyroid levels improve a bit, but not as much as I'd like by that strategy. But it's something, you know, it's better than nothing for people who don't want to do more than that. And so the traditional idea when it comes to uh, low thyroid in terms of nutrients that may be responsible, again, if you look up even kind of alternative doctors on YouTube and stuff like that, uh, they'll talk about iodine or iodine as number one. And of course, you know, a hundred years ago, there was epidemics of hypothyroidism caused by low iodine. It was such a, an issue that they started to um, mandate that it be added to the salt. And so that's where the iodized salt came from. It was so common to have people with goiters, these swollen necks, because they had uh, iodine deficiency that they would become hypothyroid. And so that's where it was made mandatory to add iodine to food. The thing is, and there are different perspectives on this, but the one that I come down on pretty firmly is that too much iodine is just as bad as too little. Uh, and too much iodine can actually cause hypothyroid as much as too little can. I don't know if the combination of high iodine plus low tyrosine is actually exacerbates that and makes that worse, but I suspect that it does. And this was exactly the situation I was in. I supplemented high dose iodine because I thought it was a good idea because I listened to certain people. I ended up with full blown medical hypothyroidism. Now, yeah. I might have ended up with that anyway. That's always hard to say. But I can at least say that the high dose iodine did Didn't not help, help at all. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and I suspect it probably did make it worse because every time I would take it, I'd feel cold afterwards. And then people were like, oh, it's a detox reaction. Da, da, da. And eventually, I've, I, honestly, I found a practitioner. And he goes, you know, too much iodine can also cause hyperthyroidism. And I was like, really? And then, you know, I looked into it. Oh, yeah, oh, God. Uh, and then I stopped. And so I found one doctor who's got a book on Amazon. I can't remember the name of it right now, but his whole book is about curing hyperthyroidism, medical doctor claiming to be doing that. And his, all he does is tell people to go on diets with basically no iodine. <laughs> really? Yeah. Okay. To slowly, you know, deplete the reserves of iodine until it's no longer excessive. And he claims that that reverses it. Uh, that's not a strategy that I've tried myself, but there's, I think he's got like many hundreds of reviews, you know, people saying it works and all the rest of it. So it's something you might want to look into if that resonates with you, you know, intuition wise. Um, so I think that the mainstream perspective that iodine is the problem and tyrosine never is, is completely wrong. That's my experience. Um, they also say selenium is commonly an issue. It can be, but I still see tyrosine much more commonly. And then, of course, for you, Chris, you also have iron. And iron, uh, low iron, sorry. And low iron can lead to a issue where uh, there is a difficulty for the T3, if you manage to get that far, getting T3 in the blood. Some people have problems converting T4 to T3, but even if you have enough T3 in the blood to get the T3 from the blood into the cells. Um, it's crucial to have enough iron to actually get it to the cells where you want it to be. So you have two markers there that makes me suspicious of the possi possibility of hyperthyroidism. And, you know, anemia and hyperthyroidism have some symptoms in common, like the low energy and the feeling cold and stuff like that. So again, this is good where it's, to, it's good to do blood tests. How do you deal with ty tyrosine deficiency? So we'll, I'll give my take and then we'll look at the report. 
Um, I would say that I love some implementation of it. It's dirt cheap. I, I can't remember exactly, but you know, if you buy it in bulk, you can buy the bulk power of like, I don't know, 10 or $20 a kilo or something. And then you only need, you know, a gram or two a day. I mean, a little goes a long way. This is not a high cost endeavor. Also, if you get a supplement, it's very, very easily absorbed because amino acids compete for absorption. Uh, a lot of people say to take tyrosine away from food so it's better absorbed. I actually add it to food because I want to increase the ratio of tyrosine to other amino acids. Um, so either way work, really depending on what you're trying to do. I guess if you are, uh, if you have a limited supply of tyrosine, it makes more sense to have it away from food. Um, so I'm a big fan of supplementation, but it is in a lot of food. It is especially, again, more in animal food, although there is some in plant protein as well but it's a bit higher in animal protein overall. Um, of course, your body can make tyrosine out of another amino acid called uh, phenylalanine, but sometimes people can have issue with that conversion. There's a version of that, which is a serious medical condition that you would know if you had it because it gets diagnosed you know, pretty much very quickly after you're born, otherwise you would die. But there is a mi much milder version of that where the body is just not as good as doing that conversion into tyrosine that is, I think, a lot more common and not diagnosed. Um, and so both those amino acids, phenylalanine and tyrosine, are in protein. So, you, sh you know, what Google or whatever says in is protein, correct. protein, meaning in, in um, any kind of protein, whether it's vegetarian or whether it's um, from animals, yes? Kind of, though it will be higher in animal foods overall. But yeah, certainly some plant foods you can get some, you know, an adequate amount from. But it's not as guaranteed, Chrissy. Yeah, it's not as guaranteed as with animal food that you're going to get some. So yeah, a especially ve I mean, it's in high in dairy and eggs as well. So really, it's more a vegan diet, like plant foods, where you're more mm, like there's more of a chance that you're not getting enough tyrosine from food. But I think it's probably absorption is more of an issue than it just not being in the food. So a lot of people potentially have low stomach acid. We've talked about this recently in an um, episode on uh, uh, chronic infections and digestion about low stomach acid and how to test for that and all that. So check out that episode for that. But um, yeah, I think often when you, some people, when you see low tyrosine, you only see low tyrosine. That is actually the case for me when I test all my amino acids. But for a lot of people, when you see low tyrosine, you also see a few other amino acids that are also low. And that was the case when we tested yours, Chrissy. Yes, there were quite um, a few amino acids that were And so in that, that case, obviously you do have a genetic need for more of it. But I would say that also digestive issues would be one of the things that I'd look at. Improving digestion so that you can absorb the amino acids better. As well as supplementation to give you what you need in the meantime. Great. Okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, so tyrosine, yeah, you know, the list here, protein-rich food, red meat and poultry, dairy, especially cheese, uh, legumes, fish, nuts, eggs. So that's most of the kind of common protein sources. You notice what's not on there, though, is grains, which is another protein source. So uh, grains are not particularly high. And, you know, nuts, and actually, yeah, seeds are not on this list either, although I don't know if that's 100% accurate. Um, I, I think it depends on the seed in that case. But yeah, I mean, nuts are mainly fat. It's very hard to get enough protein from nuts only because there's so much fat with them. Um, legumes are more balanced. They're often like ratio one to two or one to three protein to carbs. But a lot of people they don't agree with for various reasons. But if legumes agree with you, then that is a valid source. But you can see it's kind of easier from animal foods. Um, and then all the stuff here, yeah, we've really covered, I explained all that. And you can see again, Chrissy, you've got about mm, maybe 50, 60% of your SNPs there, your variants are in red. So you've got quite a lot of high risk factors for needing more tyrosine. Yeah. And I just want to speak to this point too, because as well, it's like you see a lot of red and then almost energetically, I could feel myself going, oh, wait a minute, but that's not the case. It doesn't have to. It's like, so when you do see these reports, it's not about making anybody feel bad or, or being in a way of like, oh, this is it. This is my life. It's not that. It's just data. It's just data. Yeah. I mean, in this case, it's very easy to resolve, right? It's like, you know, eating more delicious food <laughs> like like dairy or you know 
yeah, meat it, or whatever. It speaks to, you know, where we talked about psychology in previous episodes and things like that and about what you think, what you believe, and how you move forward in that. So that's another part that, you know, we did talk about um, – the other podcast going into genetics about, you know, really having it be, you know, this is, this is information for you to utilize for your health. It's not there to, you know, make you feel that, oh God, that's it. Like that's, that's all there is, you know? And so I just wanted to, yeah, bring that up for, in case for anybody going, oh my God, I can't believe she has so much red. <laughs> yeah. And I think, uh, when we tested this for you, did you need, did you have a need for more tyrosine? I can't actually remember. Yes. You did, yeah, yeah. And so again, with tyrosine, I would not say it's something you need to test. First of all, it tends to be more expensive to test than iron. Second of all, you know, by having a decent amount of tyrosine, you're not going to overdose on it. Anything you don't need, your body will just excrete happily. It's not an issue. So by all means, test for it. It's always better to test, but I would not insist a person test it before they um, supplement it with tyrosine, for instance. Any recommendations here? Yeah, there aren't actually any recommendations on this one beyond uh, just increasing the foods which are high in them. So that's all we've got here. Um, as I said, that's really it. It's it's either increase the foods or higher them or supplement or look at digestive issues which may be presenting the absorption, especially if you think you are already eating plenty of protein. That's pretty much um, your options there. So continuing along the protein track, well, there's three other amino acids that we see here. And so uh, you have a tendency for lower levels of uh, isoleucine, valine, and glutamate. And so I'm going to cover isoleucine and valine together because they are two of the three known as the branch chain amino acids. So branch chain amino acids are kind of famous in the sport or bodybuilding community. They're they're often added to like pre-workouts and during workouts and post-workouts and all that kind of thing um, because very high concentration of them is found in the muscle and because also, you remember I was saying earlier, I mean, like protein isn't ideally a source of fuel, but the branch chain amino acids kind of are. They are um, quite easily used by the body to create ATP. So that, that every amino acid has loads of different functions, but that's some of the standout functions them another standout thing about them is that they're pretty anabolic and so in the sense of uh, muscle building and increasing so again that's why bodybuilders are very into them so you definitely want to have enough isoleucine and valine because you want to have enough muscle mass right We've, right and you want to yeah. have enough energy we talked about this before that especially as you get older Lower muscle mass is something that especially women don't like to focus on, but it can lead to, you know, falling, breaking a hip, being, you know, in a really unpleasant position, that kind of stuff. So you want to have enough muscle mass. And there are lots of studies that show that people have higher, but not super high, but higher levels of muscle mass as they get older in their 70s and 80s have all kinds of better health outcomes. And just to speak to the point on the veiling, the lower levels, when we did do my test, it that was the one that showed up that I had the most need for. Ah, interesting. Okay. Um, and so why does it say lower levels? Let me answer that rather than just higher needs or increased needs like the other ones. And so I think the reason for that is because the Branch chain amino acids are a little bit more controversial in terms of you don't want too many of them. If you remember, we did an episode a little while ago, Chrissy, the longevity episode. And we actually talked about how um, isoleucine restriction was one of the potential things that led to increased lifespan, at least in mice. So this would be a reason why the fact that you tend to have lower levels may not be a bad thing, right? <laughs> may actually yes. increase your lifespan, even if it reduces your muscle mass and your energy. So sometimes there's a bit of a trade-off there. Often the things that are anabolic, even like, you know, hormones like growth hormone and stuff like that, they kind of make, you know, from a simple point of view, they can make you feel better in the moment, but they reduce your lifespan. And so isoleucine, I would say leucine as well, though I haven't seen the studies around it and probably valine are all in that category. So you have a tendency for lower levels. Whether you want to increase that or not is a little bit more of a judgment call than it is with tyrosine. And so I think that is why it's listed as a lower level. And so, you know, it's your choice. 
I would say, though, you know, as you said, you actually tested it and you showed an increased need for it. And so I would definitely increase my intake of it, as I know that you did. But all I'm saying is um, it's not, it, it wouldn't be foolish to keep it at the lower level of the optimal range. That's all. You know, right, you don't right, right. have to for get that it at the high level. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. For the uh, longevity factors. And so, you know, on the report, it says you're on the bottom 7%. So, um, you know, you are quite, quite likely to have lower levels of isoleucine daily, which you do. So, again, very accurate. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you can see some of the factors influencing leucine levels here. It talks about diet. That's obvious, depending on how much you're consuming. Uh, metabolic rate. Uh, because, as I said, isoleucine is one of those... Um, Amino acids can be easily utilized for fuel. So depending on how quickly you're burning through fuel. Exercise, again, physical activity, anything that's breaking down muscle will increase the need for isoleucine. And then certain medical conditions, age, genetics, all of the usual stuff. Uh, so yeah, there's no recommendations here other than the usual about diet. And um, because it's high in muscle, I just said that, obviously muscle meat would be the prime candidate. But dairy is also actually very high in it. And that's why, you know, the bodybuilders and stuff, they love the whey protein, right? The whey protein uh, and dairy in general is very anabolic because uh, for any kind of herbivore animal, they have to be like on their feet and ready to run away from predators really quickly, right? Good point. So with a predator, you know, we've got kittens at the moment and for the first two weeks, they like their eyes were sealed shut and their ears were sealed shut. Like, that would not be an acceptable situation if you were a newborn herbivore, right? You've seen, you know, in comparison, like a foal or a calf or something like that. They give birth and then pretty much they get up and start running, you know, and that's, they have to be able to do that. Um, and so, yeah, herbivore milk tends to be very anabolic because you've got to quickly build that calf, whatever, up to be strong. And so, uh, yeah, dairy products tend to be very high in branched chain amino acids as does red meat, obviously, because it is muscle. But the other stuff listed here, fish, eggs, legumes, nuts. In this case, we do list uh, cereals, so grains as well, uh, all have reasonable levels. And this is not something usually that a person would be deficient in unless they either have a low-protein diet in general or they have a genetic variant, exactly like you do, Chrissy. And so that's the case for isoleucine. I won't look at valines. It's kind of the same thing, really. They're, they're in the same category. Do you have any questions on that before I move on? No, I mean, I think you made a really great point about the isoleucine, about, you know, yes, it's low, but it doesn't necessarily need to be incredibly high, you know, depending. So that's where, you know, looking into those things and into the studies about longevity, you know, can be very, very helpful. I mean, so far from everything that you said, like, you know, tyrosine was at the top. That was, you know, it was... The once my amino acids, it was in order of the, you know, needing the most was valine, tyrosine, tyrosine and then isoleucine. So, so far we're coming up trumps here. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know what? People are not going to believe us about this. Could you give the editor your Nutrafol report and just put it in here while you're talking yeah, about that? Yeah, 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 I because will. Because it does sound like, it sounds contrived. Like, uh, honestly, you know, the genetics are not always as extremely <laughs> accurate as they are. Yeah, I'll give um, them a screenshot of that page so that you can, so that they can actually see it's there. <laughs> yeah, and they're not always so accurate because, of course, it depends on diet, right? And, you know, digestion and all kinds of other supplementation, right? If you were a, you know, a bodybuilder and you were having BCAA supplements all day, it would not be deficient despite your genetics. You know, there's all kinds of things. Uh, but yeah, so that's very interesting. We're going to take a quick break to share with you one of our amazing sponsors, Genetic Insights. What makes Genetic Insights uniquely valuable is that they test over 83 million different variants, which guarantees a 99.7% accuracy on all of their DNA reports. With over 100 reports available, you get comprehensive insights into what your DNA is telling you about how to optimize your health today and in the future. I found reviewing my results to be incredibly accurate and applying some of the recommendations which are personalized to your individual DNA to be extremely helpful for me and my family. I also loved how easy it was to upload my raw DNA data that I already had from previously using Ancestry.com because Genetic Insights supports uploading raw data from all major platforms. 
To get your health reports, go to geneticinsights.co and get 20% off today by using coupon code rejuvenate. Remember that supporting our sponsors supports our podcast, which allows us to keep sharing this important information with you free of cost. So go get your Genetic Insights health reports by going to geneticinsights.co and use coupon code rejuvenate for 20% off today. Well, the other one that it says you have a tendency to have high levels of um, is glutamate. So glutamate, higher levels. Why is that in red when it says higher levels? Because glutamate is not really a good thing to have a high level of. Um, the most famous thing is, uh, the most famous place where people will have heard of glutamate is monosodium glutamate, otherwise known as MSG. So glutamate it is just an amino acid. It is an amino acid that's actually very abundant in the body and very abundant in food. It's often one of the most common in whatever it is you're eating. But it is also uh, an excitotoxin. Um, what it does, especially if it's in the free form, which it is in something like MSG, and especially if it's in high levels, is it's a neuroexciter. So it stimulates uh, the neurons of the brain excessively. And in the case of something like MSG, where it's highly refined and absorbed very instantly, it can even lead to cell death of uh, brain cells. So this is why some people have real issues with MSG and why it's not actually great for anyone. Although, you know, someone very healthy and without an issue of glutamate can also be fine with it. Glutamate um, is actually really the primary what's the word, exciting uh, neurochemical in the whole body. Like, we tend to think of stress as things like cortisol or adrenaline or whatever, but these are more specific and niche. Like, the number one, if you were talking about, like, the level of ex excitation or stimulation or activity of the whole body, what is that based on? The actual, the number one answer to that is glutamate above any adrenal chemicals or dopamine or anything else. And so, you know, it's an important thing. And glutamate is opposed by GABA, which is that calming neurochemical that we've talked about a lot on this podcast. And so an excess of glutamate can make it very hard for the person to relax. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Now, we talked about this. I don't know if uh, we used that episode, but, you know, we, we went through your reports and you had like a, a low stress report and you were a little bit skeptical of that at the time, I remember. Yeah. Um, and I pointed out your, you know, that you do do a huge amount of work and you very rarely have time off and very rarely even have breaks throughout the day and all the rest of it. And I said, so if you're, if you're a really high stress person, there's no way you could cope with your, your life, honestly, the pace at which you do things. But of course... The, the pace at which you do things is probably the very reason why you consider yourself a stressed person, right? And so this is actually an alternative explanation for the pace at which you do things. You have a tendency for high levels of glutamate. You have a tendency for over-excitation. And so with that being the case, I, I would focus on at least two things. And um, number one is to reduce the level of glutamate coming in through food so you really don't want msg um, even the foods that are the highest in glutamate i think famously soy is one of them so along with the huge list of other reasons you'd want to avoid soy um, another one is that it's naturally very high glutamate though honestly whey protein which i just mentioned before is pretty high in glutamate as well um, you know, there's a bunch of things that are high in glutamate and glutamate can be made from glutamine and glutamate can be turned into GABA. So to say that glutamate is bad is a bit oversimplistic. What it does mean is that we want to encourage the conversion of glutamate to glutamine and probably not have a high amount of super um, quickly absorbed glutamate in our diet. So that would be hydrolyzed protein. That's actually one of the words that they sometimes use to hide um, MSG, they call it like hydrolyzed vegetable protein or something right, like that. Right, okay, good Good to know. But honestly, even hydrolyzed whey protein, which is becoming more popular, yes, it is a super easily absorbed form of whey protein for people who, you know, who want that, but that means that all the amino acids are going to be absorbed quickly, including glutamate. So that is a downside of that. So 
Yeah, I would say with this, it's pretty hard to deal with this dietarily, unfortunately, Chrissy, other than avoiding freeform versions of glutamate with, you know, highly refined food. And it's going to be more about like all the stuff we've talked about in like the feel good episodes and stuff like that of encouraging high levels of GABA, encouraging that conversion of glutamate to GABA. It's just uh, looking at the at my report, the NutriVal, because yeah, it's a glutamic acid. Um, that came in at 5.4, which is in the green zone and more to, towards the other end because the range is 2 to 14.5. Okay. So that's interesting. That's good. That's good. Uh, that's good. So there you go. That one is not <laughs> accurate. But but I have very like my GABA was super super low, and you said it could be made from from the the glutamine or glutamate. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's an unusual situation. So if your GABA is super super low, it's the ratio of glutamate to GABA that's more important than the absolute level of each. So that still indicates too much glutamate in relation to GABA. Yes. Yes. The, as I said, there's nothing you can take that you can guarantee you will turn into GABA and not glutamate, unfortunately, uh, other than GABA itself, um, which is more tricky. Um, but So I would do more things to encourage the level of GABA that we've talked about, things like L-theanine and um, progesterone and allopregnanolone and, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but if both of them were low, Chrissy, you could actually consider some supplemental glutamine, which is also very cheap, very easy to get tasteless and um excellent for the lining of the gut so that's something to consider but if it made you feel worse and this happens about 50 percent of the time then you know your body is converting it to glutamate so then stop but you could get you know buy yourself 100 grams for five dollars or something like that just try it see how you feel with it it's um if you if your level both were low and GABA was extremely low then that would be a case where adding some glutamine would make sense to try Interesting. And then uh, we've got a couple of others left for you. So we've got um, EPA, so an increased need for EPA. So EPA, along with DHA, is some of the um, long-chain animal form of omega-3s. And, so, and there's also DPA, but generally EPA and DHA are the ones that are focused on. Would it matter when I'm supplementing because the EPA and the DHA come together? That wouldn't matter, would it? It would matter somewhat, yeah. I mean, the different products have different ratios of EPA to DHA. Right. Some of them have 50-50, some of them have much more one, much more the other. The The reason why people usually take preferentially take EPA that I've noticed is two reasons. It's either because they um, have depression, and there's studies showing that EPA specifically helps with depression, or it's, oh, what is the other one? Is it inflammation? Uh, yeah, I think it's inflammation specifically. Yes, yeah, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, so for you, it, there's a bunch of different fish oil or you know EPA, DHA supplements out there. In that case, you can choose. The, the ratio that they have of one to the other varies actually quite wildly depending on the product. So if I were you, I would pick one that had a higher ratio of EPA to DHA if you're going to take one of those products. Right, okay. Whether you take one at all is a bit more questionable, of course. We've done episodes on our Omega-3 is actually good for you. But as we said... We're not 100% sure on this podcast if omega 3s are definitely a good idea, full stop. But we do know that if you can have any omega 6s, which almost everyone does just as a default, if they you know, ever eat out or eat processed foods or whatever, then it's good to have a high ratio of omega 3 to omega 6. And so, you know, in a lot of cases, omega 3 is uh, probably a good idea, you know, despite maybe not being 100% <laughs> great. Uh, so anyway, I'll put it this way. I would not advise anyone to take Omega-3 anymore until I really have that resolved. But I would say if you're taking any, you may as well have the ones that are the highest ratio of EPA to DHA as you have shown to have an increased need. Yes, that makes total sense. Okay. And the last one here, uh, a nutrient that is important. I remember we covered this before in a previous episode, so I won't do a deep dive in it, but niacin. So niacin is uh, vitamin B3. It is the building block for NAD, uh, which is an essential part of the ATP creation process. And uh, I, I think the skin health is, uh, episode that you did relatively recently, yes. they talked a lot about the value of uh, they. Um, uh, Amate talked a lot about the value of uh, vitamin B3 for the skin. And in general, right, he, he was into it in general and then specifically found out about the skin. 
And so Nicene is uh, the building block for that. And so it's saying that uh, you have a genetic variant that means that you do need more than average of niacin. So I think in this case, let's just look straight at the report, as I've already talked about it before in other episodes in detail. And this is a question that I would have too. It's like increased need. How much would that be? You know, what we're, what are we really looking at? What, what amount? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So we don't give that because we can't be sure. From what I've seen anecdotally, I would say uh, maybe double is kind of like a safe thing to assume in most cases. Um, of course, vitamin B3, the variation can be a hell of a lot more than that. Uh, you know, famously, Lyalis Pauling discovered that people with schizophrenics literally need 100 times as much B3, for instance, as normal people. I talked about that before. Um, but I wouldn't do any more than double without testing. So vitamin B3, because it is pretty safe to have, well, certainly double the RDI, I would be fine to recommend that to people because, you know, no one would have any safety concerns with that, unlike maybe with iron and some other things. Uh, but in terms of do I need double, do I need five times, 10 times, 100 times, that's something that only really testing could tell you for sure, I'm afraid. Right. And this is one of the useful things about this, you know, like the Nutrival is great, but it's, you know, whatever it is, five, six hundred dollars plus. Um, so this at least helps to tell you here are the few things that may be worth testing for. And in fact, if if we review that for you here, you know, probably the only things that I would actually bother t testing for and not just take some and not worry about it would be actually iron and niacin. Like ev ev everything else, it's safe to just have some more without worrying about it. And my Nutrivel did show up that I needed in, you know, B3. It wasn't the, um, the most, the one I needed the most was B2 and B7, and then it was B3 as well. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that, yeah. So the other ones, you know, could be dietary. Uh, often, to be honest, you see people who need a few different uh, B vitamins. And so, yeah, in the case of biotin, you don't have an increased need for that genetically. Although, of course, if you do in reality, that's the most important thing. Um, and same for B2. But yeah, so there's a genetic component to the uh, increased need of B3. Which is helpful because already knowing that there is the, you know, from the Nutrivel, looking at it from that way, and then knowing the genetic is like, okay, no, really, <laughs> really, you need to look at that. Because as you just said, you know, NAD is a big part of longevity. And I think the um, it does decrease as we mature, which I'm there <laughs> maturing along the way. So, so it's good to, it's really good to look at and have that information. <laughs> yeah, aren't we all? Yes. Uh, but we're doing our best to uh, yeah, make sure we're not premature aging. That's really what our channel is dedicated to. Yeah. So the type that this report is actually specifically focused on is niacinamide. And so niacinamide is one step between um, niacin or nicotinic acid which is kind of at the top and then there's niacinamide and then below that is um more nicotinamide riboside i think which is then the precursor to nad itself so niacinamide is one step closer to nad and that's the type that um it's specifically recommending here so i would assume and we can see if there's um yeah no unfortunately it doesn't list the specific gene in this case but yeah i would assume that's because uh, the yeah, it says there's only one genetic variant here. So I I would be happy to make the leap and assume that that's because you have genetically a issue with the conversion of niacin to niacinamide. Right. And okay. so um, I would, you know, if, if you're going to take any supplement as a result of this, it probably would actually be niacinamide rather than niacin. Which is helpful because I just quickly looked up the B complex that I do take. It is niacinamide. So so it's great. Yeah. So it's just confirmation, which is so helpful. Excellent, yeah. And niacinamide, usually it's used because it's the no-flush version. Um, but I, I see, you know, the Ray Peak community, who I know there's a lot of them watching, um, the Ray Peak talks about a lot of other benefits of niacin, niacinamide specifically, like um, lowering serotonin specifically. So some people do not like niacinamide. They say it's worse. Some people like it. They say it's better. So again, if you just try listening to the experts, you could get hopelessly confused. But you can see based on your genetics that at least a bit of extra niacinamide might well be a great idea for you. And then recommendations, we do get a bunch of dietary ones with this report. So, uh, but 
none of them have a lot of you know evidence impact so they're all in kind of a bit of a random order unfortunately um we're kind of in the process here of updating our reports with a lot more recommendations but it's kind of slow going so hopefully in a few months these would all be updated uh, with impact and evidence scores and they will be um ranked appropriately but uh to be honest i think these are just look at least we're giving you some recommendations <laughs> the next step will be to give you the more tailored one and just a question for the consumer let's say somebody has um you know bought uh, the genetic reports and then there's still some updating those updates will be available to them correct absolutely yeah uh what will happen is so if, once you've up, once you've um downloaded a report normally it'll just say view instead of download like it does here but once the report is updated it'll say download again and then you press the download button and it generates usually takes about 30 seconds and then it'll be the new updated report beautiful thank you for that clarification yeah thank you uh, we're always updating that's the thing you know i mean the bad part about that is you go oh it could change we're always updating <laughs> <laughs> But the good news about that is, look, more studies are being done on an everyday basis. You know, we want to be keeping you up to date with the latest research, the latest findings, you know, so stuff will sometimes change over time. So do look for those situations where uh, the status has gone back from view to download. That means well, there's an update for you. Uh, so, yeah, a few things recommended. So green peas because they're higher in niacin. Um NR supplement, nicotinamide riboside, uh, chicken liver. We're not big fans of liver here, but it does have uh, IB3. Salmon, niacin supplements, B NMN, which is another um, precursor to NAD along that uh, niacinamide pathway. Uh, aerobic exercise can help to um, uh, increase the uh, utilization of niacin and then some food sunflower seeds avocado rice you know, etc there's basically a bunch but yeah i would say it is easy usually to get enough b3 from foods to be honest compared to some other b vitamins compared to like say b1 which is quite hard to get enough from food but if you have this genetic variant then you're just an exception <laughs> that it might be more difficult for you to get enough as you found in practice and so Supplements of niacinamide are extremely cheap, you know, extremely easy to get. Um, it's not going to affect your budget significantly, I don't think. So, and as you say, they're usually part of a B complex or a multivitamin, so it's not something you need to get in isolation either. So, yeah, I usually would recommend that. I mean, people sometimes use doses of niacinamide of a thousand milligrams a day or something like that. Um, so, say a fifty milligram supplementation level of niacinamide will give you significantly more than you're probably getting from food uh, without being in any way excessive. So that would probably be, yeah, that kind of thing would be how much I'd recommend roughly to someone like yourself if they hadn't tested to see how much they need. Beautiful. Thank you. Uh, my pleasure. So I think, so that's it for your high risk scores. And then just looking at your uh, low risk ones, we've really talked about that as well. So let's look at a couple of mine before we finish. Um, we've really covered some of these in the uh, conversation because they're similar to yours uh so increased need number one calcium so this is an interesting one i've always loved dairy uh various times it did not agree with me and that was a bit of an issue but i remember at one point i was not feeling great and i did a bunch of calculations of just how much i'm having of various nutrients on a daily basis and i realized that the amount of calcium i was taking in on a daily basis was about 200 milligrams a day and the re the recommended amount uh by you know government recommendations that kind of thing rdis was about a thousand milligrams so i was way under doing it and honestly this idea of if you just eat a normal balanced diet, you should be able to get your nutrients. I mean, I've debunked this before in other episodes, but I'm just going to talk about one specific aspect of it, which is there are some nutrients that, like, if you don't eat a certain food or a certain food group, it's really hard to get enough. And with calci uh, calcium, that's really dairy. I mean, the other one would be bones or eggshells, but that's not really a part of most people's diet these days. And honestly, and this is the fourth of my list here, uh, vitamin K2 would be in a similar category. So vitamin B12 and vitamin K2 uh, have something in common, which is that they're both not really in animals or plants. Uh, well, they're in them, but they're not part of animals or plants. 
they are the product of fermentation. So they're, they're actually created by bacteria. And so uh, vitamin K2 is really only found in fermented food. It's famously high in something called natto, which is fermented soy. But natto is pretty disgusting by anyone's standards. It's, it looks like snot. It tastes disgusting. <laughs> so not many people want to have natto. So really, the only tasty and commonly eaten form of vitamin K2 is cheese or like kefir, yogurt to some degree, stuff like that. It's fermented dairy, basically. Um, so whenever I see this combination, I see it quite a lot. Someone who has increased need for calcium and vitamin K2, I always say to them, do you like dairy? And you know what they always say to me, Chrissy? <laughs> Hell yes. yes. And sometimes it's a guilty thing, you know, because they're health gurus or trying to follow a certain diet or whatever. Like, oh God. It's not just the vegans, even like your your paleos and, you know, carnivores and people are like, a lot of people are kind of down on dairy. Uh, but it's something, am I saying you have to have dairy if you have this combination? No, but I'm saying you probably want to <laughs> because you need to, you know. The, these are, calcium and K2, by the way, are really the standout nutrients of cheese. Like there's nothing special about cheese other than high levels of calcium and K2. Maybe some of the essential fats that are in there, like your odd chain fatty acids and stuff. We'll talk about that another time. But um, there's not a huge amount anyway of interest in cheese other than protein, calcium, K2, and perhaps some fats. And you may be somebody that thinks, oh, I shouldn't have dairy. I should stay well away from it. But if you have this, that could be very beneficial. It could be very beneficial. Now, of course, you can supplement, right? The problem is I said that iron would be the type of, uh, nutrient that I'd be the least likely to recommend someone supplement for because it's so hard to get uh, an absorbable form from food. Well, actually, calcium's second on that list. Like, calcium supplements kind of suck. Calcium carbonate, which is the common form, is not great. And really, there are no forms that are like super great. So, and there's so many people out there where their doctors are advising, you need to take calcium, you need to take calcium, and they're taking all of that. And I just don't know what kind of, you know, side effects that's going to be promoting into their body, especially as they, you know, age. I mean, if you actually need calcium, calcium carbonate is better than nothing, but it is a strain on the kidneys. It, it, it has a drying quality to it. It's, it's highly alkali, alkaline, which can reduce that level of stomach acid, which is an issue if it's already low. And there's lots of potential issues with it. So it is ideal to be able to get it from food if you can, either from eggshells, bones, or yes, the dreaded dairy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and the other reason why this was so important for me, Chrissy, with the calcium is that the body mistakes calcium, sorry, the body mistakes lead for calcium. It can't tell the difference. And so uh, that's one of the reasons why lead is so bad because yes, it's not like lead isn't like it, destroys everything it touches bad like mercury but it's just as bad as mercury in its own way because your body puts it where calcium should be and then it's dead it doesn't function it doesn't do what calcium is supposed to do this complicated process of transporting nutrients and waste in and out of cells that relies on calcium and magnesium interacting and all this kind of stuff None of that works if there's lead in there instead of calcium like there should be. You've s stated, you know, that's one of the biggest things that you have an issue with as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's that really probably the biggest from a medical point of view. It was, it was bad enough to almost be a medical emergency um, and at a level that for a child, it would have been a severe emergency. Um, and so calcium, there are plenty of studies that show a low calcium diet contributes to lead toxicity, like it makes lead toxicity worse. So this was very important information for me to know. And it meant I bit the bullet and uh, started having dairy again, even though there are reasons why that may not be optimal, but it just is good for me. Um, it's certainly in this situation and really with these genetics in general. So uh, there are obviously other forms, you know, the vegetarians will be saying, what about green leaves? What about, you know, nuts and seeds? The problem is, you know, we touched on this a little bit of iron. Iron is still reasonably well absorbed from those sources because it does have the vitamin C helping it be absorbed. Calcium is really poorly absorbed from those sources. Like in green leaves, calcium is bound to oxalates, which are these toxins um, naturally present in plants, um, which uh, also stop the absorption of the calcium as well as being toxic in their own right. The grains have the phytates, which again stop the calcium being absorbed. So 
even though there's plenty of calcium in some foods, not as much as dairy, but still a reasonable amount, it's, it's fairly poorly absorbed. Now, admittedly, I think uh, calcium used to be the number one mineral supplement that was recommended. It is, no, it is not anymore. Now it's magnesium. I feel happy about that to have played my small part in that because I've been championing magnesium since <laughs> 2010. So, you know, I'm happy about that. And yes, it's true. More people need magnesium than calcium. Definitely. However, some people need calcium <laughs> still, you know, that's also true. And so if you need it, uh, it's good to know that. And uh, so it's good to know the genetic basis for that. So calcium, K2, we've talked about a little bit as well. K2 is, you know, super, super important. I'm not going to talk about it again because I did a video on it already and that turned into a clip, which I think kind of went viral. I think it's one of our t top clips so far. So um, check out our video on K2 about why it's so important and why it's so great um, to have plenty of it. But yeah, it's very safe. And K2 would be one of those ones that if I see it in a person's genetic report, I'll say, go for it. Like there's, it's the only fat soluble vitamin where there's no really toxic levels at any level that a person would normally take. You know, the amount that's normally in a supplement is, you know, hundred micrograms, 200 micrograms, something like that. You could take, you know, quite a few of them in a day and it's been shown to have no toxicity. So. Now, another one here, uh, I'm going to go backwards here, actually, vitamin E, which talks about fat-soluble vitamins. So vitamin E is one of those, of all the vitamins, I'd say it's got the least evidence that you absolutely need it, like the dire consequences of not having it are not as bad as the others. Uh, skin health is usually the thing that's focused on, and vitamin E is often focused on uh, uh, added to skin products. And vitamin E is also... Uh, you know, it's an antioxidant, but there are other antioxidants, you know, both in diet and that the body produces naturally. I would say the biggest sign that I've had that I need more vitamin E is actually having high levels of prolactin. That's one of the other things um, that, that I've had in my blood test results. And one of the easiest ways to lower prolactin is to increase your levels of vitamin E. So I've actually after reminding myself of this a couple of months ago and, and biting the bullet and buying a vitamin E supplement, despite the slight lack of evidence that it is so crucial, <laughs> um, I've been taking that for a couple of months and I'll be testing my prolactin again uh, in a week's time. So I'll see if it's been effective at reducing that or not, But because that was slightly above the reference range, which is not good. You don't want that with prolactin. So yeah, vitamin E is... Uh, so we talked a lot about things that are in animal food. Vitamin E is really more, much more in plant food, um, fatty plant food specifically. So seed oils, the dreaded seed oils are all high in vitamin E. Um, you know, grain oils, wheat germ oil famously is like a really good source of uh, vitamin E. Um, it's also, uh, I think there's a little bit in fish, but not a significant amount. So yeah, that's something that uh, is, you know, high in nuts, seeds, grains, that's more where you're going to be uh, getting it from. And so probably vegans are very unlikely to have a vitamin E deficiency, probably even if you have this genetic tendency. Now, despite everything I just said about not being madly in love with vitamin E, like I am, say, with vitamin K2, it's also fairly harmless at moderate doses. I was going to ask, you know, are there any, you know, yeah, safety risks or anything like that with, with vitamin E? High levels have been shown to be counterproductive when it comes to health. So back in the, the olden days of alternative health, when there was this belief that antioxidants were going to cure everything and solve everything, they did do research with high doses of vitamin E, as well as all the other antioxidants. And it was shown that <laughs> It actually worsened a lot of health health outcomes to have high right. doses of vitamin E. But a medium amount of vitamin E from a supplementation, I've never seen any evidence that that is a bad idea. So a moderate amount. Um, or you could, you know, because it's a fat soluble vitamin, it also, your body stores it. So you could do, you know, you could do a bottle and then not have any for six months and then do another bottle, like that kind of thing to just top up your levels. If your um, vitamin E levels... Uh, if you were shown to have an increased need rather than having it on a daily basis. Okay, so next one, lysine. I have talked about this before and glycine, actually. Yeah, I mean, there's a reason why I've really done <laughs> long sections about these because, uh, you know, they're relevant to me. So lysine is famously taken on its own as a supplement, usually because it's antiviral. 
It's often taken alongside vitamin C. Um, it is uh, specifically taken usually for the her herpes virus. And so what they say is like, if you have herpes, then uh, lysine makes it worse. Sorry, lysine makes it better. And arginine, which kind of has the opposite effect. Uh, it's more of a vasodilator and a nitric oxide um, synthesis stimulator will make the uh, herpes and viral infections to some degree in general worse. So lysine, like with most of the amino acids, it's there's plenty of it in you know most protein. But lysine is one of those ones, again, actually even more than tyrosine, that is a bit tricky to get enough of from a purely plant-based diet. And um, there is some in some of the grains and also nuts, but not a lot in, uh, uh, sorry, there is some in some of the beans, but not a lot in grains. So people who, you know, consume a high grain diet, they often end up with low levels of lysine, especially. And this was discovered in cattle. They would feed cattle a lot of uh, corn and then they would develop all these horrific health issues. And then once they started adding, basically they, all again, there's corn plus lysine, suddenly most of these health issues went away. So lysine is a, a very important amino acid for the immune system, especially, although it's used for a vast, you know, vast amount of uh, different things as it lists here, you know, metabolism, collagen, gene activity, which basically means everything, you know, <laughs> there's a lot. <laughs> as it says here, low lysine levels may impair fat metabolism and reduce energy production. So there is that mitochondrial ATP energy connection as well which is obviously extremely crucial we talk about that a lot um so likely increased need for lysine based on nine genetic variants and of course again and we'll we'll put a screenshot on there this was completely accurate for me um in fact i think yeah this is the one that's the most accurate so i have supplemented with all the amino acids that have been recommended to me back in 2021 I've managed to reverse with supplementation the low levels of every amino acid except for lysine. So it's like, I, I'm still experimenting with this, but it seems like no matter how much lysine I add, I still get results back saying that I need more lysine. I think I'm up to five grams a day, which is not a huge amount in and of itself, but that's in addition to all the food sources. And I'm still getting those results back. So I just keep slowly increasing it and I'll keep doing that until I finally find a level that is actually sufficient for my body uh but yeah lysine for me this is definitely accurate this and it's it's number two on the list you know in terms of risk it's um and that is accurate that i uh ended up very depleted in lysine um and actually also isoleucine so out of the three branch chain amino acids chrissy the only one that i showed as low as when i did my uh, first neutral was isoleucine and sure enough, we look at the list here, the only branch chain amino acid that I have an increased need for is isoleucine. What are the chances? Um, I think originally I was supplementing with isoleucine for a while and I got it back up to a level where I didn't need it and then I stopped supplementing it. And I think maybe because I start having dairy protein again, like I continue to not need it. It is quite high naturally in dairy protein. So I think I kind of reversed any deficiency and kept it away. But this is, again, one of those things that if you're not having dairy, you're not having any flesh, uh, muscle, which are the two highest sources of the branched chain amino acids, um, and you have that genetic tendency for lower levels or increased need, depending on how you look at it, then it's easy to become deficient in it. And I won't talk about that again. We already talked about that. Um, we also already talked about glutamine as well, kind of. It's you know a, a building block for both glutamate and GABA. Um, it's good for the gut and it's one of the most abundant amino acids in food naturally in general, whether it's dairy, meat, beans, everything, grains, all the rest of it. So it's generally not something that you need more of it's because yeah. it's low in your diet, but you may need more of it because you have genetically need more. And I do, and I actually have been supplementing with it for a while, even though it didn't show up as necessary in my Nutrival. Um, because I've been wanting to support my gut lining recently. And that's one of the other benefits of it. Plus, uh, other than branching amino acids, I believe the highest level of glutamine in muscles, uh, sorry, the highest level of, uh, uh, the next highest level of amino acid in muscle is glutamine. There's loads of glutamine in muscle as well. So to support muscle growth and anabolism and all the rest of it, 
I've been having glutamine for that reason as well. And so, yeah, it, again, not this one hasn't been accurate for me in terms of um, showing as low on my tests, but I have felt good having even more of it. And glycine, we've done an episode on this before. Glycine is uh, an amino acid, which is uh, calming. It has a similar effect to GABA. Definitely something I'd recommend if you have a tendency for high glutamate for yourself as well, Chrissy, even though you don't need glycine per se, but it will counteract the effects of the uh, uh, glutamate. Have you been having? I've been using glycine and, and acetylcysteine as well because um, I think it's also uh, involved in the liver de detox pathway as well, correct? Yeah, building block for glutathione. Uh, do you feel the glycine when you take it? No, not really. I don't. Um, I'd have to check. I would say I, I do feel it. Like if I have, say, a teaspoon of it, uh, five grams or whatever, it definitely has a bit of a calming effect for me. So again, right. maybe I feel it more because I... Yeah, I don't think I'm taking I... that much. I'd have to, have to okay. find out what it is. Yeah. I'd say of all the amino acids, glycine is the least objectionable to most people because it literally is a white powder that looks like sugar and almost tastes like sugar. It has two thirds of the sweetness of sugar. And it absolutely is permissible. Like if you're having a cup of tea or coffee, or if you're baking cakes or whatever you might do where you would add sugar, you can actually use glycine instead. And uh, you can overdo it with glycine, but not easily. Um, it's, it's very high naturally in collagen. So if you use gelatin or collagen peptides, uh, or if you just use bone broth, that has, a th I believe it's 20% glycine and 20% proline roughly. And proline is something very similar to glycine. So this is something in nature, you know, most of our ancestors wouldn't only eat muscle meat, we'd have all the connective tissue and all that as well. So, and in fact, there's lots of evidence that we should eat that way. We shouldn't have only muscle meat because the amino acids are very unbalanced if you only have muscle. Right. So having a lot of glycine is not necessarily bad for you. And I'm happy to recommend 5, 10, even 15 grams of people supplemental in addition to diet. I was going to ask, I just checked mine. I'm getting, I'm just taking, what is it, 1300, 1300 mg a day. So do you think I should up it? Uh, you can try it. Yeah. I mean, that sounds like a capsule. Um, it is. Yeah, I am taking a capsule. So usually, you know, amino acids, you can save a lot of money by getting them in a powder form. The problem is some of the amino acids don't mix well with water. They clump and they're a real nuisance like L-theanine. And some of them taste awful like isoleucine. Uh, it's bitter in a really unpleasant way. I know you take essential amino acids, right? All eight, which includes, and you know, it's got that bitter taste to it. So that largely comes from the the branch chain. It comes from leucine, isoleucine, valine. They're the ones with the, the bad taste. Um, and so glycine, though, in fact, when I take essential amino acids, Chrissy, I often put glycine in it just to improve the taste, if nothing else. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's pretty cheap. You can get a pound for $10-ish, you know, something like that. So, yeah, if it's cheap enough, I would, you know, have a teaspoon, two teaspoons, something like that uh, to see if it calms you down. The good thing about glycine is unlike glutamine, um, you know, glutamic acid, all the rest of it, it can't be converted to uh, glutamate. Right. So, yeah, it's helpful from that point of view. So I'm a big fan. Uh, as I was saying, it's naturally by far, just like, you know, dairy is by far the highest source of calcium, by far the highest source of glycine is connective tissue in animals. So that's collagen, um, that's bone broth, all of that kind of stuff. Um, but it is in everything. It's it's not considered an essential amino acids. Sorry, it's in everything. It's in every protein, usually. It's not considered, to some degree. It's not considered an essential amino acid, but it is, um, it's the simplest amino acid, um, like structurally, chemically. So in a way you could call it like, you know, the original amino acid or the mother amino acid or something like that. Uh, of the other amino acids. Yeah, let's see recommendations. So we've got salmon, avoiding heavy sweating because that depletes your levels of glycine. Berries, yeah, like I said, it's pretty much in everything, <laughs> including berries. Uh, let's see. Dietary selenium recommends here, um, which helps, yeah, the body's overall amino acid balance. I think that's more because of its calming quality, which would help to spare the glycine. Yoga, again, because it calms you, which would spare the glycine. 
Yeah, so you can see there's a combination of kind of co nutritional cofactors here and then kind of recommendations to keep yourself calm um, and relaxed. So, yeah, I'm a big fan of supplementing glycine. I also use collagen peptides as well because I'm lazy and I actually don't trust that the bones that I get access to aren't don't have heavy metal contamination. The type of collagen peptides they get, they have they test for heavy metals and uh, make sure it's very low. So, uh, yeah. I, I am a fa in fact that's the only thing I'm having at the moment that's not vegetarian to be honest is collagen peptides but I have quite a lot of it but you certainly don't need to do that if you don't want to eat animals as I said glycine is like a sugar substitute it's really nice it's fairly cheap okay almost there increased need for tryptophan so tryptophan is a precursor to niacin which you and I have that in common again we Chrissy. Do. yeah we both need more niacin um I am not worried about that and I'm not going to in increase my tryptophan though the only reason why I might want to increase my tryptophan is if I were not supplementing niacin. But I am. Um, the other main thing that your body makes out of tryptophan is serotonin. Great, and yeah. I, <laughs> I was going to say, yes, let's elaborate. I know we, we have done an episode on this before. So yeah, just if you want to check that one out, please do. Yeah, I do not want to raise my serotonin. It's hard to explain why not. So yeah, exactly. As Chrissy says, check out the episode to learn why I'm not interested in increasing that. And the conversion of tryptophan to niacin is very inefficient anyway. But it's the only reason why I might want to increase my tryptophan. Um, let's just put it this way. Even though it's classed as, as an essential amino acid, the evidence for that is very shaky. And just like isoleucine, there are studies that show that when a person, an adult, eats a tryptophan-depleted diet, they could actually live significantly longer, probably because it reduces serotonin. So, um, yeah, I'm happy to, I'm happy to have low tryptophan. I actually don't according to my test results, but I'm happy that, you know, I, I'm not going to have any more. Now, iodine, this is an interesting one. I was just talking earlier when we talked about tyrosine, about how I probably contributed to my hypothyroidism or maybe even caused it by having high dose iodine. However, I do have an increased need for it, apparently. So it was more justified for me to have some iodine, but I just likely you know, massively overdid it. This brings me to a point as well, because of what you did say earlier about the iodine that, you know, that that could lead to things. But so if somebody sees that they have an increased need for it, what would your advice be on moving forward? So that's a hard one to answer because the normal answer to that question would be test for it. But actually there is no reliable test for iodine. By the way, the test for iodine, where well, they say put it on your skin and see if it's absorbed within 24 hours, is not based on anything scientific. Please do not listen to that. Um, a bit more scientific is the 24-hour um, urine test. So that's where you drink the uh, some iodine and they measure how much of it you excrete over 24 hours by collecting all the urine. The idea being that the more you're excreting, the less that you need. That's probably the most reliable, but for whatever reason, it's not easy to test. You can't test it with a hair mineral analysis either. The blood test isn't reliable. Oh, it's a bit of a nightmare with iodine. So here's what I would say. The recommended daily intake that they give, the governments and all the rest of it, I would actually stick to that in normal cases. And I would maybe double that, like I said earlier, as a rule of thumb for people who have that genetic result saying they have an increased need. Again, if I'd have done that, I, there wouldn't have been a problem. The issue is I was having 100 times as much as the RDI on a regular basis, which unfortunately some people out there are selling to people. And I remember a client a little while ago who had obvious signs of hyperthyroidism and they were seeing another practitioner with a lot more qualifications than me that was giving them massive high-dose iodine. And I was like, you know, it's up to you in the end. I can't. <laughs> but I, I just encourage them to do their own research and, you know, hear the other side of the story as it were and make their own informed decision uh but yeah iodine is something that i would not overdo but yeah if i have an increased need i would say double the rdi or up to double the idi is pretty safe even long term it's still not that much the problem is that people are taking as i said like a hundred times the rdi or more that's where um it can be you know potentially troublesome honestly even maybe four or five times the RDI, that can lead to hypothyroidism long-term. So foods that are naturally high in it, um, you can look in the report, but you know, off the top of my head, seafood is the obvious main source. So both uh, fish and also sea vegetables, nori and you know, um, sushi being famous, but actually kelp much more 
Um, you need a shockingly small amount of kelp to have your RDI of iodine. It's um, minuscule. Uh, kelp is extremely high. Yeah, I think that's the highest source of all. But it's also reasonably high in dairy. So even if you never have any seafood, but you have quite a lot of milk or, or cheese on a regular basis, you probably covered your RDI of iodine that way as well. So the person who's likely to be deficient in iodine is likely to be someone who has a low dairy and low seafood diet. Then it is possible that and oh and low levels of normal salt because these days it's added to you know most salt. Certainly all the table salt and all the rest is automatically added. If you're you know one of those hippies like me and you only have sea salt and Himalayan salt or whatever all that kind of stuff, then maybe you're not getting iodine in your salt. But the vast majority of normal people who have normal salt, you're actually getting a significant amount. Some would argue too much iodine from your salt anyway. So if you're also stacking on regular seafood, plus quite a lot of dairy and all the rest of it, you can see how you can easily actually get to an excessive amount of iodine uh, without even thinking about it. <laughs> you can you can end up uh, overdoing it. Uh, yeah, let's just look at what the report says about this, because uh, I can't actually remember. So yeah, a reasonably increased need for iodine, not uh, extreme. And then, yeah, kelp, yeah. <laughs> Uh, there is a massive amount of uh, uh, iodine in kelp. It's crazy. Uh, yeah, there you go. Patients who are given one to two grams of powdered kelp daily increases the concentration of iodine in the urine. Yeah, well, to be honest, fair, that's because the body's trying to get rid of it <laughs> one way or another, so that's not necessarily a good sign. But anyway, poppy seed, yeah, I mean, that's not something that people have a sufficient quantity of that I would worry about that. Um, selenium is a cofactor. Uh, that's true as well. Uh, yeah, it's just a lot of list of food, cranberry, egg whites, fish, yogurt, yeah, liver, tuna, it goes on and on. Uh, yeah, liver being another pretty high source as well, actually, which I didn't list there before. Yeah, and the only other thing, Chrissy, just, you know, scrolling through my results. Obviously, you can look at all the reports, but the ones that you have a typical need and typical levels of are probably going to be low priority to look at. But sometimes I just like, like to look at the other end as well, the ones that are in the green Sometimes they're in the green because you could have too high or too low, so then it's typical level. So again, that's not really worth focusing on. But there's a few cases, like you can see here, better response. And so interestingly, just like you, I have a better response to unsaturated fats. I don't have a worse response to saturated. It's just okay. Um, typical. So there's nothing bad about that. But it's also saying I have a particularly good response to unsaturated fats. Um, and you know, I do like unsaturated fats. I'm a big fan of nuts, for instance. Um, but I do not tend to have them much anymore. And then, yeah, better response to fat. So that was the opposite to you. And again, that is my experience. I can have a lot of calories from fat and feel just fine. And if I go in the other direction, I if I have a low fat, diet, I actually do not feel good. If I follow more of a rapey or like fruitarian or whatever, like um, limiting fat significantly, uh, I do not feel as good from that. I like to have some fat. And I do okay with protein, not great, but not bad, which again, you know, is uh, the, uh, the result that I get here. Uh, typical response to dietary protein. I've talked about my um, uh, choline here. I think, and here's typical need, I think somewhere else there's something about how I need more choline. I can't quite remember what that is. Could so, it be um, under methylation or something like that, yeah, potentially? Yeah, I think it was. And I think that was more less a case of how I need more genetically and more that I just had such a high, uh, sorry, such a low choline diet for such a long time. A bit like I was saying about calcium, that it ended up creating a problem, that it ended up creating a cholestasis. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed that episode. I hope that, first of all, it has inspired you to both, yeah, check your own genetic nutritional needs. Also, maybe to test for this stuff. Maybe you had, maybe like me a while ago, you had no idea you even could test for, you know, this granular level to see how much isoleucine you need and all that kind of stuff. It's very interesting. I hope it's helped you to realize that it can have a significant impact, um, a lot of these nutrients, and it's helped you to you know, maybe you work out how to navigate your own stuff. Um, of course, if you do want support going through your results, then I do offer consultations and it'll be, you know, very much like what uh, I've done with Chrissy today, except for 
you know, we won't talk about me at all, but just basically going through and going, okay, this is one you really want to pay attention to. This is one I prefer that you test first. Uh, you know, talking about your diet and if you're already getting enough, all of that kind of stuff. Beautiful, Owen. This has been educational. Thank you. Because it's nice to go through the reports. I mean, it's been a while since I've looked at mine, but it is a great refresh and also to, um, you know, yeah, keep on doing what I need to do. And so, yeah, thank you for this. It's been very, very good. Um, anything else bef- uh, that you want to say to our listeners before we we finish today? Oh, thank you for being part of it. And I realize it's a big thing to you know, share your genetic uh, information <laughs> with the world and sharing your test results. So I really appreciate that. And, you know, because Chrissy's here every week, you know, I haven't picked her just because her results are so accurate, which you might be <laughs> thinking I might have cherry picked her as a guest otherwise. But, you know, uh, we're here pretty much together every week. And, and yeah, as you'll see, or as you have seen, um, the, uh, you know, they, the results just are very accurate. And, the health, when it comes to, as I said, with health risks, where it's like potential disease states, the healthier a person someone lives, the less accurate the results are because they, they've they prevented any you know of those things manifesting. But when it comes to nutrition needs, I find it to actually be very accurate. So the healthier a person lives, the more that the only thing that they have an issue with is the thing that they have a genetic tendency to have an issue with. So that's always very interesting. So again, uh, as you said, the, all those reds are not a thing to worry about, Chrissy. Um, the, and the fact that they're so accurate for you just shows that you're doing everything right, um, except for that you didn't know that you had a genetic need for a few, you know, <laughs> extra of a few things. But you must be doing um, uh, fairly great. So keep up the good work. Beautiful. Yeah. No, thank you. As I said, very much enjoyed this. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Please do leave us your comments below. We want to hear from you. Let us know. Did you... You get some reports. Are you uncertain about anything that's come up? Ask us some questions. We're here to help. And please, to help us, please hit that like and subscribe button so you don't miss an episode and that bell icon. And we will see you next time. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that video. You may have noticed I recommended a few different videos in that episode. And one of the ones I recommend is just here if you want to click there. Or another one I recommend is just below if you want to click on that one and watch that next.